read from three things which all relate to rationality and how it has taken us down a rabbit hole over the last 2,500 years. And in order to do that, I'm going to begin with Matthew Arnold's poem from 1851 called Dover Beach. And after I've completed Dover Beach, I will read an excerpt from Edward Edinger's lecture, Individuation, the myth, a myth for modern man, uh, an excerpt of it which explains why Dover Beach is significant. And then I'm going to read two chapters from this book. this book, Catafalque by Peter Kingsley, Carl Jung and the End of Humanity. And so in order to uh, do all that, I'm going to begin without further ado. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window. Sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray, where the sea meets the moon blanched land, Listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling. At their return, up the high strand, begin and cease, and then begin again. With tremendous cadence, slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles, long ago, heard it on the Aegean and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once, too, at the full and round earth's shore, lay like folds of a bright girdle furled, but now I only hear but now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear, and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another for the, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as in a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. So I've been reading from Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold provided by the Poetry Foundation, and now I'm going to read to you why I read Dover Beach. In his lecture, Individuation, a Myth for Modern Man, Edward Edinger said this, and I hope that you can see the link to Edinger's lecture here. Let me just put it on again, just in case. All right, so there's the full lecture. And so I'm going to read only an excerpt in which Dr. Edinger was pointing out that since 1500, the God image has fallen out of heaven and into the psyche of man. Looking back, we can see that the God image fell out of heaven and into the human psyche. In the course of that fall out of metaphysical status, the God image undergoes an enantiodromia, 
It turns from Christ to the Antichrist. It was predicted in Revelation 12.12. 12. From, from the standpoint of Jungian psychology, this is what happened in the 16th century. Of course, all of the artists, scientists, thought that they were in the Enlightenment. They didn't consider their experience as devilish or deriving from Antichrist. Certainly not. They all thought of themselves as good Christians. They were excited by the expansion of human knowledge and energy. They thought that was perfectly compatible with containment in the Christian religion. They were wrong. History looks different from the standpoint of the unconscious, because what the unconscious does at this time is throw up the compensating dream, the Faust legend, informs us that what's going on is dealings with the devil, dealings with Antichrist. However, no one noticed until about the 19th century when a few sensitive souls understood there was something wrong in the psyche of man. Wordsworth confesses to a feeling of forlornness and regresses to pagan nature worship. Matthew Arnold, 1851, in Dover Beach, provided the classic 19th century lament for our lost religious myth. Many lovers of Edinger's generation recited it to one another in all seriousness, but this solution to the problem won't work. And we are here as though on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. The love relationship cannot stand up to the pressures. That's a dramatic image of the activated opposites. It is the problem of man who has lost his containing myth. The activated God image appears as a pair of opposites. Mephistopheles opened the problem of opposites. Adam and Eve get it by eating the apple. Okay, so that's... Um, setting the stage for what I'm going to read to you now, which is from um, Peter Kingsley's book. But before I do that, uh, let me mention that we have begun our weekly seminar in the advanced reading group on Mysterium Conjunctionis, which we conduct on Zoom. This text is is complicated but extremely interesting when you know that Dr. Jung found that medieval alchemical in images show up in modern dreams and help us understand what our self is trying to say to us through dreams and visions today. All of the 32 weekly seminar sessions that we completed on ION researches into the phenomenology of the self and Mysterium Conjunctionis are available to all members of the Advanced Reading Group. You can write skip.conover at gmail.com to be added. Okay, so Peter Kingsley has, wrote, has written an extremely interesting book. Um, well, I need to get back to the pages I was looking at. And so this is the book, Catafalque by Peter Kingsley, Carl Jung and the End of Humanity. And this book has a second volume, volume two, uh, which is all the footnotes for Catafalque. And so I urge you to take a look at that. And so I'm just going to read from chapter 14 and 15 and give you a sense of what he's getting at in this book. Um, it's uh, pretty profound. Chapter 14. In confronting the science of this time, Jung was faced with quite a dilemma. An ultimate, 
And ultimately, there's only one honest or truthful solution to this dilemma, which is to face the fact that modern science in its existing forms, with its existing concerns and preoccupations, is no real science at all. It's just a few broken, badly twisted fragments of what science should and could have been. In the most fundamental sense, it's nothing but a bastard of a science, as Jung once described the arrogant attitude that thinks it can block off access to the world of the unconscious, that believes it has the right to isolate and insulate humans from the living realms of the dead. And when he's referring to the living realms of the dead, what he means is that in the unconscious, we have tremendous logic. Certainly there is logic in the unconscious. And it comes through in instinct. Uh, all of our unconscious has developed since we were single-celled organisms. And every single one of us has descended from single-celled organisms who, since the beginning, 3.5 billion years ago, have all successfully reproduced. And we're the current end of that chain. And so all of them develop their instincts over all of that period of time, and that's true of every species. And so when Dr. Kingsley here is talking about the living realms of the dead, he's talking about instinct and Dr. Jung's emphasis that we have to look at instinct regularly. Jung's own struggles to engage with science, to question science, redefine science, warn against science, have kept people busy trying out every conceivable combination of engaging with his work or questioning it, redefining it, warning against it. But what's so easily forgotten in this battle of interpretations, personalities, words, is that on the deepest level, there was never any need for Jung to set about redefining anything. In spite of modernity's ruthless demands and its endless pressures, all he was doing was returning as a matter of instinct to what Western science had been from the very start. He was only finding his way back to what science, in the naturalness of its fragility, had originally been intended to be, a science already perfectly integrated with prophecy and healing, a science based on the arduous process of consciously descending into the unconscious, of going down into the world of the dead to bring back for the sake of others the gifts of wisdom and life. Now by this he's talking about the fact that our unconscious brings us into life perfectly so that it not only makes us think, but our hand is created during our gestation period and every other part of our body is. And so, though, so that natural instinct also comes through our psyche and it has tremendous wisdom that we need to reconnect with. This instinctive process of rediscovery has nothing to do with any familiar cliches about evolution or regression, least of all with any complicated intellectual schemes about regression and evolution at the same time. On the contrary, it's just the simplest possible matter of genetics, of ancestry, of a reality forgotten by us on the surface of ourselves, but remembered very well in our hidden depths. Okay. We have to keep bearing in mind that for Jung, unlike Freud, 
the word primordial doesn't point to something we need to make a problem of or try to leave behind. Now it seems that I am out of sync. I, I don't know why that is, um, but let us continue. If it's very irritating to you, I will uh, disconnect and uh, resume in a few minutes. Uh, so you can mention on the chat. We have to keep bearing in mind that for Jung, unlike Freud, the word primordial doesn't point to something we need to make a problem of or try to leave behind. Rather, it is the solution to the problem of modernity and the solution of the problem and the solution to the problems of modern science lies in what science once used to be. That raises the question of how or where the primordial is to be found. It's perfectly true that Jung had the finest of libraries, full of books he studied and loved. But those books aren't what made him what he was or even gave him the knowledge that he had. Assessing his wisdom by the by assessing his wisdom by his books inventing the fictional personality of a textual Jung is the height of academic absurdity because he better than anyone knew there is no way of finding primordial reality in some library. It has to be discovered inside oneself can only be uncovered by the harrowing journey down into the world of the dead. By this he means the unconscious. Great, thank you, Zarakas. I appreciate that. As for the process of reading, all the fuss about references and different texts, the best they can ever do is a lend the best they can ever do is lend a helping hand and reassuring hand offer a few timely echoes, give a bit of extra substance and form to what one already mysteriously knows, add some firmer outlines to the affiliations and lineages vaguely intuited inside. And as for where Jung's affiliations lie, I really don't have to say too much because just a few pointers should do. For example, the ancient world that perhaps came closest in meaning to our scientist was physikos, a term often used to describe people like Parmenides and Empedocles. But not only is it the origin of our word physicist, it was the source of our word physician as well, and Parmenides, together with Empedocles, happened to be healers too. This is nowhere near the end of the story, though. Apart from being the common word for a physicist or scientist, a physician or healer, physikos was also the title given to alchemists alongside those prototypical scientists we call, uh, we like to call magicians. And that brings us straight back to Jung's endless insistence on portraying himself as a pure empiricist who focused all his attention, who focused all of his attention on the facts of experience. Because the one specialist who used to concentrate more than anybody else on gathering and working with hard empirical facts was as we can see so well from Empedocles, the ancient magician. But this working correspondence between Carl Jung and the earliest Greek philosophers isn't simply a matter of generalities. It also functions, as of course it should, even down to the kind of details so tempting to slip over or ignore. Jung found himself using techniques for communicating talking, writing, which would be extraordinary enough if used by anyone nowadays, not to mention a scientist. What those techniques lead towards is something almost completely submerged. 
something very different from the heady world of literary borrowings and theoretical ideas that tends to keep historians so frantically distracted. Hardly visible anymore, thanks to the efficiency with which it was stripped out of what he wrote or said, is his fondness for expressing himself through repetition, through circling with his words around the same subjects, time and time again. But that's exactly how Parmenides, as well as Empedocles, also used to express themselves, repeating and circling around themselves from beginning to end, because it was the way they had been shown and inwardly trained how to speak. After all, this was a time-honored incantatory technique among magical healers, among the type of prophet healer, or iatromantis, that they both really were in spite of the endless later attempts to dress them up as something else. These prophet healers knew instinctively how to use their own words, not only to keep focused, but for the sake of healing, were able to use repetition for opening the doors to the unconscious and easing the passage into the underworld. Just as surprising by any modern standards is Jung's very conscious policy of deliberately using ambiguity in his writings. The language I speak must be ambiguous, must have two meanings. He is careful to explain why, for him, this is so important. Intentional ambiguity is far superior to any other available form of communication. Ambiguity alone corresponds to the nature of reality, as well as the reality of nature, can do them both justice. There are some situations, though, where no amount of explaining is going to make any difference, will ever be enough. For its own part, the bustling Jung industry has naturally, or rather unnaturally, done everything possible to sidestep any real consideration of the subject. In fact, even the people who used to pride themselves on their personal closeness to Jung have shown how ill-equipped they are for understanding why he valued ambiguity so highly. But Parmenides and Empedocles, as well as other Greeks, were also very deliberate in their use of riddles and ambiguity. They too understood that only by being intentionally ambiguous can one evoke the fullness of reality and do it true justice. And it was their welcoming of ambiguity that, more than anything else, brought Aristotle's mockery and fury down on their heads, as he, ir as he irritably complained about Empedocles, who in his life was the perfect example of the prophet healer. Avoid ambiguity. This is what people like to use when they have nothing to say, but want to pretend they are something, want to pretend that they have something to say, like Empedocles, for instance, who tricks and deceives with all his circlings and circumlocutions. And his listeners end up experiencing exactly what people in general tend to experience when listening to the words of prophets, because so long as prophets are speaking their riddling ambiguities, everyone must mindless, just mindlessly nods along. Now, at this point, I want to remind you of my coffee mug. Um, if a man speaks in a desert where no woman can hear him, is he still wrong? And the answer to this question is yes, he is. And the reason for this is that we have both uh, superior and inferior parts of all of our type aspects within our psyche. These uh, produce psychic energy. That's the opposites in Jungian psychology. And so when we get a life partner, whether it's man or woman, doesn't matter, um, 
we are looking for someone who's going to fill out our life. And you can think of, again, the yin-yang symbol from Taoism, where a complete you would be the circle, or, yeah, so a complete you would be the circle, but you are really only either the black or the white part, and your partner is the other side of the yin-yang symbol. So, and so the point is, that there is ambiguity between you and that's where life is and that's where life is for the church and so on so anyway reading on and it words their welcoming ambiguity that more than anything else brought aristotle's mockery and fury down on their heads i'm sorry i um i re went back i will get to the right point here and ambiguity has been well and truly excluded, drowned out by the voice of rationality, by what Jung liked to describe as the petty reasoning mind, which cannot endure any paradoxes, or at least this is what rationalists choose to think. But what they forget is that originally ambiguity and paradox were an integral, essential feature of real logic of the sacred logic which always stands untouched, although savaged by reasoning. Ambiguity is the voice of prophecy, and at the same time is like the wildness of nature. It plunges us into the streams of paradox, is a constant confrontation with our conscious need for control. And strangely enough, ambiguity itself is not ambiguous at all. On the contrary, it's perfectly clear, an endless invitation into the open landscape of reality. Paradoxically, it's only the process of reasoning that, with each step it takes in trying to stamp out ambiguities, ends up creating new ambiguities instead, even while pretending to be on top of the very same situation, it's simply making worse and worse. The voices of Parmenides or Empedocles or Jung are so confusing to our conscious mind because they are calling us into places most people have lost the courage as well as the knowledge to go. Their ambiguities are total non-ambiguity, the confrontation of humans then as now with the truth of themselves. But at the same time, these ties linking Jung to the ancient world reach even further and far deeper than that. Memories, Dreams, Reflections is the name of the famous book published just after he had died that he ended up ambiguously referring to as his so-called autobiography. And certainly it contains his own voice along with the voices of his secretary his editors, his publishers. Many expert hands came together to smooth over and set straight what he had said, domesticate it, antify it, by making, antify it, quote unquote, by making it into something even the stuffiest of old maids would be happy to hear and discreetly, when necessary, help it disappear. Some of the things he wanted to say managed to get through. A lot of what he tried to communicate never did. And even though a more or less accurate record survives of the original memoirs that Jung himself dictated over a period of two years, it never was too easy for much information about them to trickle out. Now, this is a reference to the protocols that Agnella Yaffe held and it has been announced that the protocols will now be published in 2020. Um, so I will continue on to the end of this chapter, then I'll take a brief break to respond to your chat. One of those things that has never seen the light of day was his reply during the first week of October 1957 he found himself being asked to speak out honestly 
about the real nature of his work. This is hardly a surprise. His reply is bound to sound so insignificant to an ordinary reader, so trivial, so devoid of any serious meaningful content, that it would be a miracle if the passage had been allowed to stand in his published biography. As he starts speaking, you can still hear him laugh. He declares that his entire work, all his presumed wisdom and grand achievement, boils down to this, that he fell into a gigantic hole from which he somehow, if he was going to survive, had to dig himself out. Then, after quoting these words of Homer that always came to him whenever he pondered his luck in returning alive from the underworld, quote, glad to have escaped from death, unquote, and making sure to recommend them as the best possible motto for the story of his life. He goes straight on to make the simplest of statements. His whole science, he explains, derived entirely from his visions and dreams. In just a couple of sentences, with the help of that free association, he fell into when he fell into when dictating his memoirs. He has spelled out a message which from any normal point of view is not just striking. It's incomprehensible, paradoxical, bizarre. And this is precisely why no one has paid it any attention. Jung is saying that everything one could refer to as his science really came to him from the underworld, from visions, from dreams. And this is exactly what Parmenides, master of incubation, or entering other states of consciousness, lord of dreams, had demonstrated when he brought logic along with the freshest discoveries in Western science straight back from his journey into the underworld. Jung is simply reliving the way things used to be. But just as Parmenides' teaching would soon be covered over and its integrity broken by Plato, along with so many other well-intentioned thinkers, the spirit of this time got to work very quickly and officially to cover over what Jung had wanted to say. In fact, it's essential to remember that the entirety he chose to refer to as the spirit of our time isn't only obsessed and fascinated with all the trivial superficialities of life. Just thinking about it that, w just thinking about it that way could hardly be more wrong. On the contrary, there is nothing this spirit enjoys more than entertaining itself with what it doesn't understand, than fiddling and tinkering and interfering with the wisdom of the depths, subtly and imperceptibly rationalizing it, ever so cleverly making a mess of it by presenting it with a grand flourish as something of its own. And if you wanted, you could call our present understanding of Jung a masterpiece manufactured by the constantly buzz by the constantly bustling spirit of this time. Okay, so that was chapter 14. I'll take a look at your comments and then I will go on with chapter 15. Um, right, e as Miles says, each person is their expert in spirituality in your depths, absolutely. And not to say that each person doesn't need to listen to others, but must discern for themselves in their context and life experiences. Absolutely. Zarakis, I assume inspiration and the unconscious are very much intertwined. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, so going on, uh, chapter 15. Just two days earlier, on the 1st of October, 1957, Jung was at Bollingen, the stone tower and retreat he himself had designed, then helped to build, near the far upper edge of Lake Zurich. Here, too, as soon as he started talking, it was about his original dreams and visions, 
the visions and dreams from which all his later work would flow that he wanted to speak. His words that day were duly noted down as usual by his secretary and eventually they would turn up mauled as one of the most thrilling climaxes in the published version of his biography, right at the end of the most central and crucial chapter called Confrontation with the Unconscious, Jung appears in grand style as hero of the depths, the hero whose whole life was transformed when he managed more or less successfully to work on the chaos of unconsciousness and against overwhelming odds, hammer it into a shape and form he could present to his contemporary world. Of course, such a basic heroic role is something Jung himself delighted in playing when, the, when his number one personality took the stage. Now, his number one personality was his ego, and his number two personality was his self. And the myth of him striving valiantly with his ordering mind to inject some conscious arrangement into this unconscious chaos, just like the familiar notion of the unconscious as an incredibly destructive power that has to be worked with, but mastered, organized, directed, is central to almost any appreciation of his work. There is only one problem. On that day at Bollingen, what he was saying could hardly have been more different. He begins, not ends, with a comment about his more or less successful effort to impose some order on the seething material erupting out of the unconscious, Com compares his initial visions and dreams to the flow of fiery lava, which after a while turns into solid stone so it can be worked on. But only now does he explain where all his thoughts and comments have been leading. Quote, it was the passion and intensity inside this fire. It was the stream of lava itself, which is the force that compelled whatever happened to happen. And so completely naturally, everything fell into its own proper place and order, unquote. And this is where we need to pause before going on. Jung's words move. On this particular day, they were carrying him towards open acknowledgement of how the unconscious takes care of everything. We can have any number of anxieties about disorder, any amount of busy fantasies about imposing some order on it. And the reality all the time is that the unconscious forces we are so frightened of are themselves par paradoxically, mysteriously, the true creators of order. But for Jung's secretary, Agnella Jaffe, this was all moving in the wrong direction. She was writing a biography, almost an autobiography, and in her commendable devotion, wanted to keep everyone focused on the virtues of the great man himself, not on the virtues of some unnameable unconscious. So with plenty of well-intentioned thoughtfulness, she scrupulously reversed the flow of his thinking, systematically inverted the sequence of his own sentences, ever so delicately turned everything on its head. If it was just a question here of Jung's own secretary dutifully tampering with the things he said, that would be significant enough, but it's only the start. Almost as if he guessed that not everyone would understand what he had tried to say about the stream of lava taking care of everything, Jung goes straight on to repeat himself in even simpler and blunter terms. And now we no longer have to rely on Yafe to educate or entertain us. The one scholar who for years was able to study these unpublished interviews independently and in far greater detail than anybody else 
decided to make a translation of this very same passage available. And here, word for word, is his version of what Jung at the Tower in Bollingen went on to say next, quote, I wanted to achieve something in my science, and then I was plunged into the stream of lava, and then had to classify everything. The trouble is that here, too, Jung, had, Jung said nothing of the kind. What he really did say was very different. Quote, I wanted to achieve something in my science, and when I bumped into the stream of lava, and then it brought everything into order. Here is perhaps the closest one could come to a confession from Jung as an old man about what in his life was really what. The science he had tried to lay claim to, in spite of all his dashing dilettantism and amateur theatrics, on its own it came to nothing. All it did was bring him face to face with something infinitely vaster and more powerful than himself. And from then on, that power arranged and guided everything. Of course, you could say none of these distortions, these gross mistranslations, actually matter. And on a certain level, you would be right. We are well past the stage where a couple more murders here and there are going to make much of a difference. And I am perfectly aware that from any rational point of view, not one single detail in what I have mentioned is worth thinking or even reading about. Besides, nothing would be easier than to say, we knew that anyway. It's common knowledge that regardless of all his warnings and cautions about the dangers involved, Jung's whole work is based on his profoundest respect for the wisdom contained in our unconscious. The fact is, though, that it never was or ever will be a question of what anybody knows intellectually. We can understand everything just wonderfully on the level of theory, of principle, but that's not the point. The point is to watch how even the people closest to Jung, on, alongside the brightest, most scientific of Jungian experts, change him rewrite him, silence him. And we too might have the most brilliant knowledge lodged away in some drawer of our theoretical brain. But the only thing that counts is what each of us does in every moment with each thought of ours, every breath. All that matters is whether we can consciously stay with the mystery of the unconscious helping it in its wisdom to arrange and order things, or whether we use our own accu accumulated wisdom to interfere. Naturally, one could call these misinterpretations and mistranslations sheer human error. Anybody determined to be uncharitable could even call them downright negligence or worse. And in a sense, they are both but in another sense, they are neither. It's not just that they emerge independently, spontaneously, from some intelligent individual here or there. They are simply collective manifestations of the spirit of our time. The trouble is that in our spirit, the trouble is that in our superficially individualistic culture, we have no context for understanding this kind of mistranslation. No language, no frame of reference. For us, these misinterpretations are just accidents, if we ever notice them at all. It doesn't occur to us that there could be such a thing as a psychology of mistranslation, a pathology of rationalization. And this is because those murders committed so many centuries ago by Plato and Aristotle, have become the stream we all swim in. Our entire lives are a rationalization, one big mistranslation. But that only ever comes visible, if we can muster the courage to look, 
in the case where someone like Young steps out of the stream. Then it's immediately the same old story as with Parmenides and Empedocles all over again. When Parmenides was taken down to the underworld only to be given everything he knew by the Queen of the Dead, she sent him back into the world of the living as a messenger, as a prophet whose job was essentially do everything in her name. Of course, in this world of illusions and deceptions, he had to appear to be a human like any other human, and if possible, play the game of humanity better than anybody else. But for Parmenides himself, the underlying reality was that everything was being ordered, arranged, forcibly directed and guided by the divine power of the underworld inside him. And quite naturally, that's not the end of the parallels. Just as Jung's words were misinterpreted, mistranslated, altered, in exactly the same way Parmenides' words were manipulated and changed to make him say what others wanted him to say, what they needed him to say. Back then, as now, one had to do whatever it took to make Parmenides take the credit for his wisdom, not the sacred. It was simply a question of how best to tamper with his words to arrive at the desired result, and then that result becomes enshrined as history, the history in which we silently agree to bury reality. Okay, so that is chapter 15, and um, I think it's a pretty profound chapter because it, uh, those two chapters really point to the fact that Dr. Jung's work was about bringing our instincts into common usage, and most people don't really understand that. Now, I also wanted to read to you um, just a description of Matthew Arnold. I mistakenly clicked the print button on my printer when I pulled up the Poetry Foundation page, and I got all these pages about Matthew Arnold. I'm not going to bother you with all of them, but I will read the first paragraph. Among the major Victorian writers sharing in a revival of interest and respect in the second half of the 20th century, Matthew Arnold is unique in that his reputation rests equally upon his poetry and his prose. Only a quarter of his productive life was given to writing poetry, but many of the same values, attitudes, and feelings that are expressed in his poems achieve a fuller and more balanced formulation in his prose. This unity, was ex this unity was obscured for most earlier readers by the usual evaluations of his poetry as gnomic or thought-laden or as melancholy or elegiac, elegiac and of his prose as urbane, didactic, and often satirically witty in its self-imposed task of enlightening the social consciousness of England. Um, now, let's see, Arnold became, ultimately became um, professor of literature at Oxford. And so, um, or no, Professor of Poetry at Oxford. And so maybe I'll read a little bit more. Assessing his achievement as a whole, G.K. Chesterton said that under his surface raillery, Arnold was, even in the age of Carlyle and Ruskin, perhaps the most serious man alive. A later summary by H.J. Muller declares that if in an age of violence and attitude, the attitudes he engenders cannot alone save civilization, it is worth saving chiefly because of such attitudes. A view of Arnold's continuing relevance 
which emphasizes his appeals to his contemporaries in the name of culture throughout his prose writings. It is even more striking and would have pleased Arnold greatly to find an intelligent and critical journalist telling newspaper readers in, 18, in 1980 that if selecting three books for castaways, he would make his first choice the poetical works of Matthew Arnold, which was published in 1950, because Arnold's longer poems may be an acquired taste, but once the nut has been cracked, their power is extraordinary. Arnold put his own poems in perspective in a letter to his mother on 5 June 1869. Quote, it might be fairly urged that I have less poetic sentiment than Tennyson and less intellectual vigor and abundance than Browning, yet because I have perhaps more of a fusion of the two than either of them and have more regularly applied that fusion to the main line of modern development, I am likely enough to have my turn as they have had theirs." Unquote. The term modern, as used by Arnold about his own writing, needs examining, especially since many readers have come to see him as the most modern of the Victorians. It is defined by Arnold in On the Modern Element in Literature, his first lecture as professor of poetry at Oxford in 1857. This lecture, the first to be delivered from that chair in English, marked Arnold's transition from poet to social as well as literary critic, stating that the great need of a modern age is an intellectual deliverance. Arnold found the characteristic features of such a deliverance to be a preoccupation with the arts of peace, the growth of a tolerant spirit and capacity for refined pursuits, the formation of taste, and above all, the intellectual maturity to observe facts with a critical spirit and to judge by the rule of reason." Unquote. Okay, so as I said, this goes on for 25 more pages, but uh, I thought I would share that with you. Um, Ian says, hello, hello. Miles says, I think we need to change business as usual by appreciation of all instincts, and this means mother knows best as an important instinct. Well, it certainly often is true. And Miles says, was it G.K. Chesterton who said, uh, the most empirically verifiable fact is the evil of man. I don't know if he said that, but that sounds pretty evil to me. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, uh, just to wrap up here, um, I'll, I'll start, I'll read my little uh, homily again. Uh, please support this YouTube channel by sharing videos you like with your social network, particularly Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook. Please subscribe below. We want to maintain the benchmark of having more than 50% of our viewers as subscribers. Uh, we also support, we also welcome Super Chat sponsorships on all live streams and Patreon sponsorships. And so um, the Super Chat f sponsorship can be found on the little dollar sign underneath the chat, just in case you don't know what that is. Um, and uh, I had asked people to subscribe a couple weeks back, at which time we were getting about 48% 40 of our viewers were subscribers, and that number has moved up to 52, so I'm grateful that many of you have subscribed uh, since you started to uh, watch these videos. And so I think that this book, Catafalque by Peter Kingsley, Carl Jung and the End of Humanity, I've read now three chapters of it, chapter one and chapters 14 and 15 
I'm only doing that as a tease to get you interested in this book because Mr. Kingsley has some very, very interesting things to say. And uh, not only about Dr. Jung's life, but about um, our modern way of thinking in entirely. And his views are worth um, thinking about and so meditating on. So anyway, thank you for joining me today. I'm having one of my uh, uh, self-hypnosis struggles right now where if I read some of this complex stuff, it somehow hypnotizes me to the point where I can almost go to sleep and I'm having that reaction now so I don't think I should go on uh, right now or you're just going to have me sleeping on the screen <laughs> so I will stop for now and and uh, see you again another time perhaps tomorrow um,